Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time of day it is, wherever you are right now. Thank you for tuning in to the Conversations with Dr. Don Show. The show is produced and broadcast from the Portland, Oregon area. And for your first time viewers, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique, one of a kind individuals and about whatever it is we've decided to talk about tonight. And we'll be talking with Dirk Dunning. And uh, he's just delightful because we just finished taping uh, a show before we're doing this one right now. And I'm just fascinated by him, and my mind is still spinning because he's just so brilliant and so fun to be with. And I like to talk to somebody who's so much better than I am because I'm still learning. <laughs> and sometimes you see me kind of quiet with, because I don't have anything to say. You're so far out. It's beautiful. <laughs> far out. I like it. That's good. Are you still relaxed? Oh, yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. I'm not nervous anymore. Good. Well, a little bit. Yay. <laughs> Okay, so the bio, the first half of this show will be uh, rather abbreviated compared to what we did on the first show because hopefully my viewers will be watching both shows and get a more detail of the bio segment for you. But anyhow, let's, let's start off with uh, uh, when and where were you born? In 1955 in Ellensburg, Washington, central mm -hmm. Washington state. Yeah. So you remember the questions I asked you at the first uh, show? I do. You want to see if you can uh, repeat them? Oh, I, I do not have a photographic memory, so that doesn't Really? I, no. That's unbelievable. Okay, and remember, why were you born? Oh, yes. Uh, mostly to experience the world and find out how much is here and what's going on. Yeah, how far have you gotten with that? Um, I've gotten far enough to realize I don't know very much. <laughs> yeah. And cultural or uh, national uh, uh, racial heritage? It's all over the place from Northern Europe mostly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you look at my genetic analysis, it's um, about half out of England, Ireland in the last 500 years. But if you go back before that, it's huge amounts coming from Scandinavia and from Central Europe. Uh -huh. um, and before that, I've got a very high level of Neanderthal plus some Denisovan thrown in. So I have really weird things where when you look at my genetics, it's fun because there's a guy that I've got a lot of relationship to, as do a lot of Europeans, who was in central Siberia 45,000 years ago. And through them, I'm actually related to the Clovis people. <laughs> 10,000 years ago yeah. in the Americas. It's very weird. Yeah. You're never at a loss for words. No. <laughs> Good reason. And we talked about your religious preference, and now you're a-religious or skeptic or what? I, no, like I say, I, my religious views are about as complicated as you could possibly get. Um, I don't fit any particular religion, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of the views that, as we were talking in the previous segment about uh, spirituality, that would probably be a better definition in a lot of ways. Um, a lot of what I've done in doing esoteric things has been connecting with those who have died, those who've moved on, uh, helping people who have died and have not completely transitioned to find their way. Well, when you do things like that, you end up getting an entirely different view about who we are. And you start finding out that we're all interconnected in ways we never dreamed which is fun stuff. How did you get, how did you get the kind of a brain or cortex that, that you, you got? That's just so weird and fascinating. I'd like to take claim for having chosen the right parents, but it wasn't my choice. <laughs> <laughs> but I did choose well. You've chosen every darn thing else in your life, probably. Probably. Yeah. And we talked about your education. Now, touch on that a bit. Uh, so, a lot of schooling. Huh? Yeah, so let me go through that a little different than I did before. Of course. Um, I went through Mount Hood Community College for the first two years. Which Mount was Hood Community College here in Oregon. Indeed. And it was absolutely magnificent place, particularly in the first years. We had fun things like uh, <laughs> that first uh, spring, I think it was, we had the world's tricycle jumping contest, the one and only. And there was a lake then called No Name Lake on the campus. And uh, Ace Hayes won with a world record 32 feet 8 inches. 
Uh, the Guinness Book initially was going to accept it and decided, no, this is too dangerous, and that was the end of that. Um, but Mount Hood was a truly astounding and wonderful place. A and bicycle jumping contest? Tricycle jumping. Tricy <laughs> and so what they had was a ramp that went down from this berm that connects the two parts of the campus. Uh -huh. And this plywood ramp went down to the lake and had a kicker at the end. And so people had these over overbuilt tricycles and would ride it down this thing and go flying out into the lake. <laughs> it was great fun. It was very dangerous, but it was great fun. Mm -hmm. Anyway, from uh, Mount Hood, which was amazing, I then went on to Oregon State, where I got my Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering with honors, uh, 1977, a long time ago. And then from there went and basically became a licensed nuclear operator for with the U.S. Navy and Westinghouse, training sailors to run nuclear submarines, mm -hmm. which that was an entirely different experience. Mm -hmm. um, but then through life, one of the things, I've never really been caught in the idea of having all the letters. I could have, when I was in college, gotten two minors along with my major. I didn't do that. I was not far off from a second major. I really didn't care about that. But I've also then done a lot of others where I've, <laughs> I've done other things of learning things throughout my life to where uh, University of Southern California at one point approached me about teaching. And so I ended up teaching in Puyallup, Washington for civilians, for the Army, for Air Force, for Marines, um, an entire set of coursework on Master of Safety and Systems Management. The funny thing about it was, is in order to teach that, I couldn't sign the certificates because I didn't have a master's. I taught all the coursework, and what they'd do is have one of their graduates audit the class and then sign the certificates as the instructor. So I did that for several years. That was a lot of fun. What qualifies you to do that? Um, work experience. Uh, that was at a time when I was manager of chemical operations at Fairchild Semiconductor, and um, University, of, uh, University of Southern California was looking for people who had the right kind of experience. The things we were doing was off the bleeding edge, and they just didn't have folks who knew it. Well, we knew it because we did it. It's what we were doing for a living. Wow. So anyway, there was that. Following that, I ended up leaving Fairchild, doing private consulting, a lot of this self-taught, where I was doing code review, code compliance into the building and fire and plumbing and life safety seismic codes, and a lot of other things in, in doing industrial engineering design. But also then, I ended up going to then work for the state of Oregon doing Hanford stuff, and for the next 25 years, I got to meet with single, double, and triple doctorates continuously in about every field of science that they touched on. Mm -hmm which was a continuing education. It was wonderful. Of course, yeah. So getting to work with some of the best in the field in just about every kind of chemistry, physics, uh, geology, it was a great experience. Did they appreciate your brilliance? At various times. A lot of times they were quite annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> Why, because you were smarter than them? Sometimes, but the big thing is, I don't even think of it in those terms. It was yeah. that I would be bringing things to the table that came from other fields. And so one of the problems was sometimes the language would get difficult. Um, as it turns out, within certain fields of, of science, they have different names for the same thing. So in different fields of science, if you have something that's sloped, it's a slope, it's a dip, it's a, it has a lot of other names. If you use the wrong word for what they're used to, they don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking to a geologist and you're talking about the slope of the soil, they'll look at you like you're strange because they expect the word dip. If you're talking to somebody else, you've got to use different words. And so you end up having, as you go along, to learn all of these different jargons within sciences that end up being their own unique languages. Did you find a common thread among these people you were associated with during, during this time period? that would indicate some degree of spirituality? Usually when that came up, it's on the side. Uh, as an example, I had one uh, science researcher at Pacific Northwest National Lab. I'm not sure quite how he became aware of some of the things I was doing in my private life, but after we had this very long technical discussion one day with about 30 or 40 scientists, we got to the end, we're leaving, and he said, hey, could you come to my office for a minute? I need to talk to you, and I'm thinking, uh-oh. And so we went down the hall, and he, he very carefully closed the door, and uh-oh. And he said, well, here's the thing. My son and I were having a talk last night, and it turned out it had to do with death and dying. 
and what happens after you die. But it was not anything he wanted any of his colleagues to hear him talking about. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was very strange that the world became isolated in those ways. Yeah. Anyway. Death and dying. Mm -hmm. Say a few words about death and dying. So we talked the last time about part of what I do in my private life, which had to do with a, a wonderful place called the Monroe Institute, where they use sound to help you achieve very interesting altered states and, and out of body and all kinds of other things. Um, by the way, if you, if you decide to go there for some reason, anything you want, one of my own rules for the place is, anything you want you can't have. You can have anything else, just not what you want. <laughs> and the reason that happens, I think, is you get caught in your logical mind. You can't let go of that. Uh -huh. If you could, then that would happen. But you, anyway, you get caught in a cycle. Well, anyway, with doing the things at Monroe, you get into all of these weird, interesting, esoteric discussions and esoteric things. What do you mean by esoteric? Say a few words about esoteric. Not of the usual world. Um, so esoteric would be, as an example, uh, having a near-death experience uh -huh. and all of the things that go along with that. The information that you end up gaining, what happened to you along the way. Um, another might be going out of body, where, okay, what is this? Um, the first time, if you have never had an out-of-body experience, the first time you do it, you very much feel like you're wandering around out in the world, like now, except you forgot to bring your body along. And you, you've had that kind oh, yes. of experience. Oh, yeah. Uh, did it trouble you the first time? No, actually, the first time was funny. I, uh, I, I came aware, I, came, I suddenly realized I'm standing in a store in the cold remedy section. And I kind of looked up and realized, wait a minute, I'm not supposed to be here. And I don't know why I knew that. And I could hear some people behind my right who were busy doing morning stuff. I thought, I'm not supposed to be here. So I turned to leave and I went to go out the front door and it had the normal breaker bar that you push to open the door. And I went to push on it and my hands went through it and then I went through right behind them and I'm suddenly standing on the street. And I realized, oh, I know where I am. It's Santa Fe, New Mexico. Well, I'd been there a couple of weeks earlier and one of the things I learned in Santa Fe is they've got wonderful art. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I would go to Santa Fe, I would put my wallet in my luggage and lock it up because I didn't want to have my credit cards with me because I'd buy something. <laughs> so that week I'd been there on a training thing, I was particularly admiring a couple of dolphins by Kay Schwimmer, brass. They were just magnificent. But I made sure that I, when I'd go to the galleries, I made sure not to even look at the names of the places because I didn't want to be tempted to buy. So I came awake, I'm now standing this morning, I'm standing in Santa Fe, New Mexico, not understanding what just happened, and I realized, oh, the gallery's just right over here. So I walked up the steps and into this little indent, and I went to grab the doorknob, and my hand went through it again. It's like, oof. And I walked through the door. <laughs> went down the hall a little ways, and I stood back, and I could look up at the sign. It's like, oh, it's the Looking Glass Gallery. Now I know the name. And again, I went through the door there, which was another instance of very strange feeling what it's like to go through a door where you don't open it. <laughs> And sure enough, the dolphins were there, and there was the gal who ran the shop was at the cash register, and she's doing morning till work. And I went over and tried waving my hand, and she couldn't see me. And so I was trying to read the telephone number, and I just couldn't get the numbers to hold still. And I thought, huh. And I'm thinking, I really want those dolphins. And that's when I suddenly woke up. I'm laying in the dark in Salem, Oregon, going, huh? What? So I ran downstairs and turned on my computers, and I looked up the gallery. Sure enough, they actually existed. I got the phone number and I called, and the proprietor answered the phone and she said, uh, I'm sorry, we're not open yet. I said, I know, you're counting the till. Well, that kind of took her aback long enough that she quit saying anything. And so I said, oh yeah, you'll remember me. I was in a week or two ago and I was looking at the dolphins. Oh yeah, yeah, I'd like to buy them. Two days later, they arrived. <laughs> that was my first conscious out of body. It was a stunning experience. How many of those have you had? Oh, I don't really even count anymore because between those kinds of things, you can have out of body, astral projection, you can have a number of different ways of doing that, that they blend one to another. They're different in some ways and they're the same in others. And so it's hard sometimes for me anymore to tell where do you draw the line. Yes. But 
you know, classic true out of bodies where you feel like you're physically present, probably about a dozen. Okay. I, I'm not quite to the point that I can control when it happens. And one of the things that's funny is whenever it happens, you have this idea of, well, I want to go see Paris, or you want to do something intentional. But what I found is when I go out of body, I, I forget all of that because I've got other interests. So it, it's a little frustrating in that sense. So you have no problem with ESP? Oh, no. Uh -huh. So going back to Mount Hood Community College, there yeah. was a gentleman there who was the chief lab assistant who was great, Dan. We had a, a, a tremendously good time. I was working as a lab assistant paying my way through school. And he was a mad scientist in many ways, and a hard scientist in others, and absolutely wonderful gentleman. Well, we got to playing with all kinds of things, including uh, telekinesis, telepathy, past life regression, hypnotic, hypnotic regression, um, what would today be called remote viewing, then it was called remote sensing, because mm -hmm. it hadn't even been developed yet. Mm -hmm. And we pretty well proved all of those, which was great fun. Oh, man. And so here was the, the blend between the fringe of science, which is science, and the hard sciences where it passes all of the rigorous testing. One of the things we found with a lot of this was because of what we found for ourselves, we could show that there were a lot of things you could not actually ever do proofs on. Because if you can actually read someone else's mind, a lot of bets are off about is a scientific experiment actually independent of the person doing it? It gets really strange. Mm -hmm. But you know, doing the work at Hanford, yeah, all of this, we couldn't talk about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've heard of a book called uh, The Elephant Whisperer. I haven't. That sounds interesting. Yeah, it comes to mind right now. A few words about it. It's a guy who is, uh, has a preserve in Africa. I forget mm -hmm. which country it is. And he has a reputation in the uh, in that area where tourists are going in and the uh, herds and uh, animals and all that stuff, what elephants are, are really unique in that now and then mm, there's a rogue troop that cannot mm -hmm. be tamed, that cannot be controlled at all. So then the, his reputation is uh, there are other people besides him who have preserves. And if the, somebody from another preserve has a herd that can't be tamed, so they contact him and say, you want to take them? Because we're going to put them down. And he says, OK, I'll, I'll take them. And they have to pay the freight and everything sure. else. And this, it's, a, it's a story of his being able to communicate with elephants and elephants communicating with him and not being able to define what and how it happens. Mm -hmm. All they can report is the evidence of communication. Mm -hmm. it's a clear communication between when he thinks he is communicating with the elephants, the elephants are communicating with him. So skip to the end of the book where he finally dies. Mm -hmm. Well, the elephants of his last tribe, the elephant whisperer, Mm -hmm. uh, trek, I think it was seven or eight days from the preserve where they were to where he was when he died. And they hung out for about 24 hours after they got there. Mm -hmm. And then they turned and returned back to the preserve where they were acclimatized to, uh, uh, adjusted to. Just fascinating. <laughs> Oh, you would really appreciate it, I think. There is a gal who does work with tigers uh -huh. and, and other big cats. And similarly, the cats will have whatever trauma or problem has caused them to be completely out of control. And she can go in and chat and connect with them and suddenly understand them and commune with them and everything's now okay. Really? And I've forgotten what her name is or what the story is, but. The, there's been a couple of specials about her that are just amazing. Yeah. And it's the same way. Talk about extrasensory perception or all those kinds of other things we were talking mm -hmm. about a few moments ago. I thought I'd test uh, that on you to see if I can learn something more from you in that regard. I wish so. I didn't know that one. Mm -hmm. uh, take a glance at it. And you've, I think I you'll will. find it fascinating. Cool. 
So, yeah, education and uh, political persuasion. I didn't, didn't ask you that before. Do you see yourself as left, or right, or centrist, or what? Um, well, it's kind of like the, uh, the religious question. I don't fit anywhere, mm -hmm. which I think is a good thing in some ways. Uh -huh. um, at the same time, given the way our society is structured, it creates an issue. Uh, you know, as a young man, I was a Republican. Mm -hmm. um, I long since ceased identifying as any party. I end up being registered as one, mostly so that I can vote in a primary, mm -hmm. because our system is so weird. But, you know, I don't really have an affiliation with any of them. Mm -hmm. I've learned through life, you know, a lot of things about what we need to be doing about caring for each other and dealing with things, and none of the parties really deal with that very well. Um, particularly, I think the bigger one is is that, you know, I've been following the problems with climate ever since I was in high school, mm -hmm. and especially in the last 20 years and in the last decade, and where we are on climate is probably the single most critical issue that we have, and yet it's not one that any party has really taken on. That's why I phrased the question in terms of left or right rather than in terms of political parties. That's useless. Well, even beyond that, when you look at Oregon, just as an odd example between Oregon, Washington, and California, in Oregon we kind of have a political split of progressive libertarian. Mm -hmm. In Washington they have a different split that's mostly liberal libertarian, and in California it's conservative liberal in, in some parts. Uh -huh. But as you go around different regions, even those change. It's not a left-right spectrum. It's a much more complicated thing than that. Uh -huh. How about looking at the world and human beings in terms of wealth and social responsibility? Yeah, that's a little easier because it's defined by what it is. Mm -hmm. And so right now we have a massive accumulation of wealth in a very few number of hands. Mm -hmm. I look back to the 1950s and thereabouts when the country was in a much better place. We were much more equal financially. We had a big middle class and we had a lot of stability. Now it's much harder. Why is that? It's where the money wants it to go, I suspect. The money wants it to go? The people with the money. Oh, thank you. I Those who you. have I'll want more. One moment. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, when we define everything ter in terms of dollars, we get everything in answers in terms of dollars. Yeah. Well, particularly Hanford is an example of that, that if you look at trying to solve some problem, whether it's Hanford or any place else, if your only measure is dollars, anything that can't be converted to dollars doesn't count. So all the human terms, for the most part, don't count, no matter how important they actually are. All right. Uh, how I'll about take you even one more step. Okay, please. So in the last 25 years, I got to work very closely with the Native American tribes of the Pacific Northwest, particularly the Yakapa, Yakima, the Umatilla, Nez Perce, Wanapum, and, and those groups. You worked with those people? Very closely. What do you uh, mean by that, work with them? So person to person? Person to person, and uh -huh. also the way the tribes work is they, like anybody, end up hiring technical staff, and the technical staff quite often are not tribal. And so there's this strangeness that happens between having the tribal folks having white folks or whoever, if you will, mm -hmm. working for them where there's a clash of cultures of trying to understand, and in time they end up understanding better how the tribe thinks. Um, but along the way, I got to work very closely with Russell Jim, with Donna Pawaki, and a whole bunch of the others, Rex Buck. Amazing people. Russell Jim, in particular, is just astounding. Um, Russell passed away here just a few months ago. He was a dear friend and truly astounding guy. But I would hear him say things in meetings that the, the managers and the engineers and the scientists involved in the cleanup just simply couldn't understand. Mm -hmm. and they would try to interpret what he said and they'd end up spinning off in some weird direction because they couldn't understand the perspective the tribe had. That for them, as an example, the tribe thinks of the world as being a circle. Everything is a circle. You can't really throw anything away because there is no place called away. Whatever you throw away, it's going to come back. How wonderful thinking. On the other hand, you look in, you know, in traditional culture, everything's linear. We go get something, we do with it, and we throw it away. There's no such thing as a way. Huh? There's no such a way. There is the circle. They, the tribe also tells via stories, and so they remember immense amount of history in oral. 
Um, so one of the things I got to do, particularly because of issues at Hanford, was talk with the tribal members as well as staff and learn about the history of the Pacific Northwest for the last 10,000 years through the eyes of the tribe. And so they would tell stories about the great cataclysmic floods that ripped across the Pacific Northwest 10,000 years ago. They remember them like they were last year. They remember where the dangers were, where they could go, where they couldn't go, when they could and couldn't go, what times of years things happened. They remember the great flocks of swan that flew over the site. Today we have ducks. Then it was predominated by swans. They remember before there was sagebrush for most of the time at Hanford, where it was a different kind of environment. They remember where the foods were of different kinds and what they could eat and what they couldn't. Because that for them was their breadbasket. That mm -hmm. was where all the foods were and the medicines. They also have all of their religious traditions, so I've gotten to go to a lot of their very sacred sites. Really? And they are amazing places. Uh, there's a couple of them up on the top of Gable Mountain that are just absolutely astounding. For most people who are not sensitive to it, they won't know there's anything there. But on, if you go up on the west end of Gable Mountain, it's an amazing place. Where is Gable Mountain? So on the Hanford site, Hanford site's 500 and, well it was 560 square miles, it's huge. Yes. And Gable Mountain kind of sits to the north in the middle, just south of the, the turn of the Columbia River. Mm -hmm. So the Columbia River comes down on the west, turns and goes to the east and has a, a horn, and then flows due south past the site and down into Oregon. And Gable Mountain kind of sits straddling up in that horn, along with Gable Butte off to the west. But there's all kinds of things there to be had if you know they're there if you're open to feeling it and knowing it. Feeling it, that's, yes. Yes, yes. And also, you know, spending the time. It's like the scientists, they've done a lot of work trying to understand the great cataclysmic floods of the Pacific Northwest. And what this was is at the end of the last ice age, as things have gotten suddenly very warm, the ice sheets were blocking the upper reaches of the Columbia Snake River system. And they would back up a lake in Montana, Lake Spokane, that would be a thousand cubic miles of water. It's enormous. Mm -hmm. From tribal tradition in the fall, after the salmon run, along about October, September, the dam would break and the lake would drain. Well, it makes perfect sense when you think about it that you've had all summer long for the ice to be heated by the sun. And then when the rains begin in the fall and start filling the lake, you have that maximum stress where the dam breaks. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, the entire lake would drain in 48 hours. A thousand this is a yearly miles. occurrence? Uh, about every 55 years. Okay. So it'd take 55 years or so for the lake to fill enough to put pressure on the dam enough that it would finally fail one year. And so then what that would do is rip the soils off eastern Washington state as it came roaring across the state. Um, it's where the Dry Falls came from, which is an amazing place. Mm -hmm. um, I've been there. There's all kinds of gorges and, and whatnot all across that area that are just amazing. It would back up a lake that was 1,000 to 2,000 feet deep over the top of what is now the Hanford site, where in a period of just hours, this thing is suddenly 1,000 feet deep, suddenly pushing water down into the soil. And then over the next week, that water would all drain away. And as it did that, it releases all that pressure and the whole site would suddenly go through huge earthquakes and shake and settle and classify all the sands and soils. The water also continued down the gorge and formed two more lakes, one here in the Willamette Valley of Oregon, where it's a lake 400 feet deep, entirely down the valley all the way to Eugene. Our rich soil here in the valley came from eastern Washington. That's where our soil originated from. So you have these immense stories going on about this and the tribe remembers it all. The scientists would go in and dig cores and cut away soils and analyze it and try to logically figure out what happened and it would be funny at meetings where I'd say, well, you know, thus and so happened. They said, well, you know, well we can't prove that. I said, have you talked to the tribe? They wouldn't talk to the tribe. <laughs> but the tribe remembered. Anyway, it was fascinating. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So we might as well take a break now because I want to be sure we have enough time to cover Hanford. Sure. A break, please.
Okay, we are back. And thanks for staying tuned. And for your viewers who missed the opening of the show, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique, one of a kind individuals and about whatever it is that Dirk Dunning and I are talking about. And we'll be talking about Hanford, the never ending Hanford situation. What does that title mean, the never ending Hanford situation? So, Hanford, for those who are not familiar with it at all, yes. Hanford was the Manhattan Project. It was a site in eastern Washington state, uh, originally 1,000 square miles, most recently 560 some odd square miles, and now it's down to about 285. And the Hanford Project was? Yes. Now, Hanford Project, the Hanford, or sorry, Manhattan Project covered a bunch of different sites in different states. So there's uh -huh. a site at Rocky Flats in Colorado, Savannah River, South Carolina. Uh, there's a couple in Tennessee, uh, New York, elsewhere, uh, and also the national labs. Yes. Hanford has a national lab with it, Pacific Northwest National Lab, but principally what Hanford was was a site that was selected in, in 1940s. Uh, I always, always hesitate on the date because it, it's, it's a little unusual in my mind. Anyway, they, um, it was selected and set out as the place to produce plutonium for nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. When it was done during the Second World War, nobody knew if this would work, and it was a big, deep, dark secret. So what they did is they hired a company, DuPont, to come in and do it. DuPont agreed to do the entire job for one dollar. They didn't want any profit associated with making weapons of war, at least this kind of weapon really? of war. DuPont. DuPont. So anyway, they. Uh, Everything that was done initially was done by engineers. And so all of the names and whatnot, the numbering identification system is very organized and it makes perfect sense for engineers. For common people, it's a string of letters and numbers and it's complete gibberish. Yes. But if you know how to read the numbers, it actually makes a lot of sense. So their identifications told you a lot more than just simply what the, the designations were. What they had was the site was broken up into um, three big areas. There was an area down near the, the uh, town of Richland where it's sitting right along the Columbia River. And what they did was to fabricate fuel for the nuclear reactors they were building and also do testing on all kinds of things. This is the 300 area. Up in the center of the site they had twin areas that are the 200 areas, 200 east and 200 west. And what these were was sites where they ran very large processing facilities to dissolve the nuclear fuel and separate out the plutonium, put it into pure form to ship off site to go make nuclear weapons. It's where they made the biggest mess. Then along the river they had nine operating nuclear reactors, eight of one type of reactor and one that's a little different, where they were sitting right on the edge of the Columbia River, pulling water from the river in to cool the nuclear reactor and then dumping the hot water they back lots out. lots of water. Yes. And so the criteria that they needed and the reason Hanford was selected where it was is there weren't many people. It's a very large expanse. It has lots of cooling water with the Columbia River. Yeah. Um, it's surrounded by a ring of mountains, so it's easy to guard and to keep people out. And so security was good. It had reasonably available power from the big dams. All of the aspects that they needed were there and they could get labor fairly easily. So all of that worked in the favor of building Hanford where it is. They looked at other places, one in Oregon and several elsewhere, but Hanford easily won the final decision. Hanford, when they ran it, the basic idea was they would produce nuclear fuel out of uranium, put it into the nuclear reactors and run it for some period of days, maybe 100 days. Where did they get the uranium? Where did they get the uranium from? Um, the uranium, I think, in that case was mostly of American origin. Mm -hmm. Now a lot of it's coming out of other parts of the world. Yeah. But back then it was probably mostly coming out of the Navajo Reservation. Um, and so it came from here. Uh, there's lots of problems with that and what happened to the Navajo. Sure. As well as the other sites where it was dug. We did have one uranium mine in Oregon. It never produced very much, like 100 tons in total. Uh, it's down in uh, Lake, County or, uh, Lake County in far southern Oregon. And they made a pretty good mess there digging up uranium. Um, actually, one of my coworkers oversaw the, the final closure of that site. So there is that part as well. But what Hanford did 
its whole job was to produce plutonium to make the nuclear weapon that destroyed the city of Nagasaki and then later went into building the nuclear arsenal. Um, it is an entire facility whose purpose was war. That was its purpose, always was. And so it's got a lot of different interesting problems. One is that you were asking about my own cultural background and whatnot. My family comes from Eastern Washington State. I have family scattered all across the region. Um, my uncle, Abe, um, was the number six badge on site. He was the millwright foreman for the first crew from DuPont that built the site. He later was a senior manager and his badge number was six. No wonder you know about Hanford. Actually, I never learned a single thing about it from him. And while I was growing up, we never heard about Abe. He was kind of the black sheep of the family. Nobody knew anything about him. He had just disappeared. And then later in his career, he suddenly appeared again at a party at my aunt's house. Like, <laughs> I'd never known this guy. He's a great guy, he's a lot of fun. But um, anyway, Abe, he'd been off at Hanford and it was all top secret, so he couldn't talk about it. So he just didn't. Um, anyway, that was, that was the beginning. My grandfather actually even had another piece of it. My grandfather had five sections of land that he was running, uh, 10,000 head of horse and 15,000 sheep, or maybe I have those numbers backward. And he would run the sheep down to the Doris Ferry in the Columbia River, and so some of the archival history of Hanford, you can see these sheep arriving at Hanford. They were our family's sheep. So there's all these strange things. Um, I had one point I had the opportunity to go into a facility called the plutonium finishing plant where they actually made metallic plutonium. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, through my efforts, we got the first tour for the public to get inside the facility ever. Uh, <laughs> and when we went onto the backside where they did a lot of the work, it was interesting because when we went to sign in, you've got like five different badges and a death dosimeter and all these strange things. And my cousin, Abe, was authorized access. His father, Abe, was authorized access, and me, the three Dunnings. <laughs> but what was interesting is Abe, my uncle, had been dead for 10 years, but he was still authorized for access. <laughs> Somebody forgot to close the loop and remove him. Uh, you get That's the only place I've ever, ever managed to find his name and his signature involved in the site. Even though I know what he did and I know what his job was, he was involved in building a lot of it. So on the one hand, we have a lot of folks in my family who were downwinders, they were exposed in various different ways. We have one part of my family who was involved in building it, myself and, and my cousin involved in helping clean it up. And so we've got a lot of different ties to the site in different ways. Well, culturally, when you look at that site, culturally it's more like rural Oregon and rural Washington. Mm -hmm. It's very different than the big cities. And so the belief systems, the values, et cetera, are different. During the Second World War, the big thing was about building these weapons in order to defeat the great menace, you know, starting with Germany and then Japan. That mindset continued all through the bomb building era, through the Cold War, when it shifted to beating the Russians. That all stayed there throughout that time. And when finally Hanford was closed from production, there was a lot of waste, but the people who were there who'd been hired to run it were all very much along the lines of, they're building weapons to defend America, we don't do waste. And so there was a real problem of getting them to understand cleaning up the waste is an important thing. And even today, that's a bit of a problem. Um, there's also a problem that very much because of early origins in the site, there's this idea that radiation is less dangerous than people think it is. And that very much dominates a lot of the thought in the Tri-Cities area, the, the Richland, Pasco, Kennewick area it's hard to get past that. And a lot of the early days were centered around trying to convince the public that this was good because nuclear weapons need to be built, it's good, right? Well, the reality was the harm was not less than people think, it's more than people think, quite a bit more actually. And so those kinds of things even remain today. And you have problems in the decision making where there's a lot of belief within the Tri-Cities that, well, this really isn't that big a problem. We should be spending the money over here instead, except when it comes to taking the money away from their jobs, like, no, 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 we need the jobs. And you get this weird schizophrenic kind of thing going on sometimes. Um, but but it, it, it doesn't disappear, like you were saying no, earlier on. The waste doesn't disappear. 
DOE did, over the many years, the U.S. Department of Energy, did a lot of work where they did all kinds of things to separate things out of the waste, trying to produce things. They uh, also made a lot of mistakes. At one point, they had so much radioactivity in the tanks and they kept concentrating the waste because they had no place to put it. They didn't want to spend money to build more tanks, and so their answer was just to make it more concentrated. Um, Glassification? No, no, not treating it, just keeping it in a tank underground. Okay. And so there's a huge number of these very large tanks underground, but one of the things that happened is because they wanted to save money, and during the war, chromium was at a premium because of the need for the war effort, what they did was to use steel tanks rather than using stainless steel. Oh. And because they did that, the, the waste coming off the plants is acidic. You can't put acidic waste in steel, it will eat it. So their answer to that was to add caustic soda, sodium hydroxide. And what that did was neutralize the waste and protected the steel. Today, the vast majority of the chemistry of the waste in the tanks is sodium salts, sodium nitrate and sodium hydroxide and, and related, sodium carbonate. And so part of the view of the folks locally tends to be, well, you know, mostly it's not radioactive and so therefore it's not a problem. Well, it's intensely radioactive, it is a problem. But one of the things they want to do is try to separate the waste into parts that are the highly radioactive part and parts that are less radioactive and going through all kinds of gyrations from that. Anyway, the, uh, in doing each of these steps, they created problems. Well, one of the things they did by concentrating it is the radioactivity isn't just radioactive, it also releases a lot of heat as the atoms break up. And so the waste in the tanks, in some of the tanks, was so hot that the tanks were what they described as self-boiling. That the waste internally is continuously boiling and they keep having to add water as water is being boiled off as steam. And at one point in 1965, they made a serious blunder. I, there was a gentleman who was in charge of one of the tank farms, a group of these buried tanks called the A-Farm. And he went on vacation for a week and he turned over the job to another guy. And while he was gone, they had messed up in some way and didn't add as much water as they should. And one night, tank A-105 overheated so much in its bottom that the concrete underneath it overheated, formed live steam, and the concrete exploded from the pressure. That ripped a 15-foot gash in the bottom of the tank and the high-level waste drained out into the soil. It also vented live radioactive steam up through a vent header on the adjacent tank next to it. And one of the technicians in the trailer hearing this giant roaring noise came out with a radiation instrument, stood at the entry to the farm and measured the radiation levels and they were just horrible. That actually made the newspapers. Nobody really recognized that it was as bad as it was. And it wasn't until years later we learned about a facility in Russia in, in a place called Kishtim where they had a similar tank explosion, only this was a chemical explosion, not concrete. And what it did was actually blew the top out of the tank and scattered radioactivity over a huge area. Fortunately, that didn't happen at Hanford. We had something much different. But today, if you talk to a lot of the folks on site, the managers and a lot of the technical people and engineers, they have no recollection that A-105 ever blew up. There is an unfortunate problem that as time goes by, people forget the past. And so in some ways, the site suffers from a problem of institutional Alzheimer's, where they're continually forgetting. And there's a lot of things that are out there that they've forgotten are there, and they've forgotten how severe they are. So because A105 blew up, one of the things they did is they started a program to go through the tanks and remove the waste, chemically remove the thermally hottest, most radioactive parts, put the rest of the waste back in the tanks and put that highly radioactive part over into another facility where they convert it into a, into a form of salt and put it into metal capsules and then put those in a facility underwater where they sat for the next 40 years. Okay, so about, I think it's about 60 some million curies. Curie is a measure of radioactivity, it's quite large. There's about 60 some million curies of radioactive material in this facility in these capsules. Mostly radioactive cesium. Uh, there's over 1,300 capsules of that. And about 600 capsules of radioactive strontium. The cesium emits, a, uh, through its daughter product, it emits a really powerful gamma ray. It's like an x-ray, it'll go right through things. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they're extremely dangerous if you pull them out of the water. So they have to keep them under a lot of water and keep them cool. What they didn't know 
is that the gamma rays cause problems in other ways that because of the number of capsules they're sitting right near the concrete both on the floor and the sides and a couple of years ago we had a report turned up that detailed how much radiation the concrete had been exposed to as it turned out the radiation dose was so high that their prediction was that the concrete in the middle of a one foot thick wall was down to 85 percent of its normal strength and the faces of the concrete are essentially worthless all you have then is this middle part that has any structural integrity at all. This is a facility called the Waste Encapsulation Storage Facility. They've got weird, terrible names. That facility is one of the ones I wanted to, to talk about because they're actually working right now over the next couple of years to get all of the capsules out of that facility and to put them into dry casks to store them up on the surface in an area not too far away from this building. This is going to be a huge success once they do it. The problem is that there is question always with funding whether or not anything continues. This facility was built in 1973, 71 to 73. It went into operation in 1974 with the first capsules going in. And the capsules have been there other than a handful ever since. Well, that means in the last 40 some years, they've, the capsules have been damaging this concrete. What they didn't know was that concrete, when it's damaged, if the concrete is wet, if it's got water in contact with it, behaves in one way. If the concrete is dry, if it's like concrete in a building with air in contact with it, the moisture leaves the concrete, it dries out, now it's much more sensitive, much more easily damaged by radiation. As much as 2,000 times more easily damaged by radiation. Well, the analysis I told you about before about what the strength is of the concrete is based on wet concrete. This concrete is dry. It has a stainless steel skin protecting it. And so likely what it means is in the bottom of the basins, the concrete is just no good at all. This also applies at a lot of operating nuclear plants and storage facilities all over the world. And it's the reason that the next part is really important and the reason I went through all that detail is that it's really important when they get done moving the capsules out of this facility that they don't just tear it down, that they now go in and, and score this concrete and find out exactly what its conditions are so they can understand real world what did this radiation do to the concrete and what does that mean for every nuclear plant in the world for the storage oh pools that sit God. next to them. It's a huge problem. Um, as it sits today, uh, if there was an accident, a major earthquake at the facility, if anything drains down the facility, if you go back to the original design documents, once the water drains out and the capsules are exposed, the radiation fields are truly enormous. So much so that you can't get within you know, 2,000 feet of the building. You just can't go there. Well, if you can't get near the building, you can't add more water. And if you can't add more water, the capsules overheat and over time, they begin to corrode and fracture and break open, releasing their radioactive contents. At the same time, the tremendous amount of heat that's there and, and the radiation will damage the concrete that is the building, and the entire building will slowly fall in on itself. And then as rainwaters come, they will start to mobilize the radioactive cesium. And what happens over a period of years is it now spreads across the site, contaminating everything to the point that you can't do cleanup at all because people can't go there anymore. So one of the difficulties in dealing with places like Hanford is if people forget about the vulnerabilities and what those vulnerabilities can do to them, then they forget how important it is in an accident of what they have to be focused on because this could lead to places we just can't deal with that become like Fukushima and Chernobyl where even robots die, that there's just no way to deal with it. So anyway, like I say, WESF is on on course to become a great success in getting the capsules out. And part of the problem with that is if or when they do get the capsules out and it is a great success, people won't know what the hazard was. They won't understand what a great success it is to get those out or what a tragedy it was that it that was allowed to ever be that in the first place. And so there isn't a lot of ability to learn from it. Yeah. Anyway. We're, we're running down to about, mm, we have about uh, four minutes left for you, four or five minutes. Okay, so <coughs> I'll give you two other ones to worry about. Sure. <laughs> um, one is there's the $17 billion waste treatment plant. It's on course to try to begin to 
glassify the nuclear waste in 2023. It's got a lot of problems. There's a big portion of the facility that will probably never operate because of the technical issues. And that, that alone we could talk about for several hours if anybody wanted to, but it, it, it's mind-numbingly technically difficult. There were a lot of decisions that were not the best. At the same time, it's the first time anybody's ever tried this on this scale. So there's a lot of things there in a lot of different directions. Um, but they need to proceed and they need to push hard to get it done. And the reason is because of the next problem, that there were 28 tanks at Hanford that had two steel walls. These are so-called double shell tanks. And the way they work is you have an inner tank that's essentially a kettle, it doesn't have a top. And then an outer tank that comes up and the inner tank connects to it loosely. So the outer tank is a full tank and the inner one is just a pot like you have on the stove. In between the two there's an insulating pad and underneath it there's a concrete support pad. And there's all kinds of different technical details about it. But because of the way the system was designed for all of these tanks, they had parts of it they did not understand that they weren't in control. Where water was coming underneath the tanks, they had various chemistries happening that they didn't understand. And as a result, because of the chemistry issues, one of the tanks, AY-102, failed here a couple of years ago, beginning in 2011. Uh, it was actually recorded failed, I think, in 2012. That tank, when the inner tank failed and released its waste into the annulus, into the area between, mm -hmm. suddenly created a huge problem and they had to pump all the waste out. It took them two years to do that. Where did they put the waste that they pumped out? Into the other double shell tanks. But those were almost full to the gunnels anyway, and it cost them $100 million to do it. By waiting until a tank failed, they ended up having to spend $100 million for no really good reason and it leaves waste trapped outside the primary tank that they simply can't get to it, that DOE will probably want to try to decide to just leave it there in the environment. The problem though is that when you look at the other tanks, there are eight of the other tanks that are in horrible shape. There is one of them in particular that because of the way they ran the air and, and cooling systems, it probably has corroded entirely through the secondary tank wall meaning it is now a single shell tank and under the regulations it should be emptied immediately. There's another seven of them that are not far behind. It takes about seven years to build a new tank. But the time, between the time you decide and the time you get the funding and actually go do it is about seven years. Any of these tanks could fail at any time between now and then and be another hundred million dollars at least to clean up the mess except there isn't space for the waste. It goes on. Anyway, those are some of the big problems and, and things people should know about that it's not likely to go off into the environment, up into the air and spread, but it may end up discharging into the soil at some point if they don't fix the problem first. Oh, man. You're so uplifting. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, uh, last question. Uh, can we extend uh, our thinking out into the future and see when, if at all possible, we're going to have this under some degree of control that can last for infinity? So DOE has done a huge amount of work, and uh, very good work, in getting the waste cleaned up along the river, digging mm -hmm. almost down to, in some cases, down into groundwater, removing a lot of contamination along the river and putting it up in a huge disposal cell in the center of the site. They've torn down a huge number of contaminated buildings, mostly the less contaminated buildings. They've shut down a bunch of others, cleaned out some. Um, one people have prob probably heard of, the plutonium finishing plant that I mentioned, is almost entirely torn down. But they made a mistake as they went along and they were doing what's called an open air demolition and they spread radioactive plutonium particles across the site. They now think they've got that under control and they're about to start again here in the next week or so. And there's more. But the problems are really huge, and the thing that they need mostly is more effort and more money. Okay. <laughs> Time out. Time out. We need to tell the viewers some final thought you have for in about 30 or 40 seconds or so. All right. Um, Hanford, though it isn't something that everybody's going to pay, pay attention to, is something that's really important, and we must not lose attention to it. Um, there's been a huge amount of good work, particularly with the Oregon Department of Energy, Washington State Department of Ecology, EPA, and a lot of the work by the workers on site to get things under control. 
there's also been a lot of problems. Um, they've made some mistakes and they're going to make others, but we've got to get it done. And particularly the big one is we need new double shell tanks. Yes. We've got to get the capsules and dry storage. Okay, well, thank you so very, very much. You're welcome. Oh man, fascinating, very fascinating. Yeah, and no time for public service announcements, but oh, I want to thank you again for watching, and I believe you enjoyed uh, Dirk as much as I have. And uh, remember KFC, not Kentucky Fried Chicken, Dr. John's KFC, kind, friendly, and charitable, be kind. Be friendly and be charitable to you too, and you too, and you too, especially in the control room. And we'll be seeing you next time. Thanks for watching.